But let's be honest, how many of you just by a show of hands are sort of done with 2020? <laughs> well, you have no choice. You'll be done with it in a few hours, whether you are ready to be done with it or not. It's just the reality. I remember uh, in November or October of 2019, so right before the new year last time, I was driving on I-90 going by Sacred Heart Medical Center, and around that time we just had received, I think, four patients that had COVID because our hospital in Spokane is one of the only few in the country that could handle patients of COVID because they had all the facilities and all the ventilation and the protective gear. And as I'm driving on I-90 past Sacred Heart, I'm also listening to some public broadcast about, uh, you know, concerns of citizens about COVID being in Spokane. And I remember very clearly somebody on the radio, it was a public health expert saying, have no worries, there's no way this will get out into Spokane. And here, <laughs> here we are 14 months later. And it, it didn't come from those people. It just swept the whole world. The pandemic swept the whole world. And sitting here 14 months later, it's been a year of shutdowns and businesses going under and hospitals being overwhelmed and political fights over masks and social distancing, the effectiveness of school closures, the effect effectiveness of shutting down. Uh, the world has become divided in 2020, even in the church. Disagreements on strategy. How do you balance the need to keep people safe, especially those with underlying conditions and the elderly, and balancing that with, you know, the need to provide livelihoods via keeping things open like businesses. And it got then, of course, 2020 had to be an election year on top of that. So everybody's super friendly on social media. <laughs> um, and this year has been crazy. And here's the thing. This is not a political sermon. Regardless of where you stand or what side you are on any of those issues I just mentioned, one thing can be true for all parties. We're all tired. <laughs> We're all exhausted. 2020 has taken it out of us. Some of you maybe had a great year. You have started an online business and you're rocking it. And we're happy for you. Uh, but as we wrap it up, as we say, I'm tempted. I don't know if you've ever been tempted to just ask God, why? Why did this have to happen? And here's on the onset, just a thing that we believe in this church, the thing that we always talk about is we believe in something called the providence of God. And here's what that means. It means that we believe that God uses both the good and the bad that sometimes even isn't even his will, even stuff that happens because of a broken, sinful world, things that God really does not will into existence, like pandemics and murder and all these horrible things. But the power of God is not that he'll just take a magic wand and make everything go away like it's a fantasy movie. The power of God is that even the bad stuff that is meant to crush us, God can turn around and use it for our purposes to shape us and to form us into mature people who actually have the value system of the heavens and the kingdom of God instead of the worldly material stuff. God can use both the good and the bad to shape us. This is a thread of truth that runs all through the Old Testament and all through the New Testament. Name me one person in Scripture who God used or his people that did not go through a hard time. You won't find it. Everybody has gone through something really difficult. And that's really the obvious thing through all of history. There are people like Moses and David and even Solomon and Saul and the prophets and Jesus and his disciples and Paul and Peter Everybody in the scriptures, Ruth, had a difficult confrontation with the harshness and the reality of a fallen sinful world. And there have always been two responses to hardships. There's always been two responses to 2020 that I see in the media, in the church, and in the world. It's the two responses that we're very tempted to run to. And they're either hide from the problem or run away from the problem. To hide and withdraw from this world and say, I don't agree. I'm going to have a bunker mentality. I don't like masks. I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm just going to surround myself with people who agree and think like me. And we're going to hunker down and keep each other close. The rest of the world is lost. And then there's the runaway crowd. The away with these problems. We just have to get back to what? Normal. As fast as we possibly can can. Anybody who tells you otherwise, it's fake news, it's a hoax, it's, it, we just need to get back. They're trying to reset the world economy, <laughs> right? 
we either withdraw from the problems because it's like, I don't want to get into that, or we just run through and say, let's, let's just get back to normal. But there is a third option in Scripture that God offers to his people when confronted with challenges that are outside of their control. Because let's be real, some of the stuff we face in 2020 is out of our control, and maybe we won't have control moving forward. And the third option that God gives his people is to lean in to your new reality, no matter how crappy or bad it can be, and to live a faithful life. To lean in and live a faithful life. The most stark example of this in the Old Testament is the book of Lamentations, the book of Jeremiah. This is a time when Jerusalem was experiencing something far worse than COVID. This was the city of God. This was the place where God lived. His temple was built by Solomon. And then about 586 years before the birth of Christ, which we celebrated last week, the Babylonians came in. And they destroyed the city. They destroyed the gate. They destroyed the wall. They burned the houses down. They salted the fields where the crops grew so nobody could plant there again. They took all of the educated, the noble, the wealthy, and they carried all of the talented people from Jerusalem into captivity into Babylon. And they left the poor, the farmers, the widows in the city that was destroyed and smoldering in ashes. And the, the remnant that was taken away to Babylon, they also were very tempted because this was their 2020 to respond in two ways. There was a group that wanted to hide and withdraw. They were in their prison garments. They were given prison clothes. They didn't want to take the prison clothes off and live in Babylon because they thought there's no way because if we put on Babylonian clothing, we would have lost. We're just going to huddle in our prison clothes and we're going to wait for change. We're going to wait for God to rescue us. We're hiding from reality. And there was a second group of people who wanted to run away from their 2020, run away from the problem. This was the hero response. These are the ones going, let's go back and beat these guys down and take back our land. And they surrounded themselves with prophets who told them, yes, take up arms. You can defeat this place. Go back, rescue Jerusalem. They were like the nationalistic, we're going to solve this problem because we have the intelligence and the strength and God is on our side. But there was one guy. That everybody knew, regardless whether you were on the hide away and withdraw side or the run away from the problem and let's get through it side. They knew that there was a prophet in Jerusalem, Jeremiah, who God had spoken to. And they heard news that this Jeremiah had received a word from God to speak into the middle of their trouble. And he wrote a letter and sent it by courier to Babylon, to the exiles. And so here they are. They all gather in anticipation to hear how would God solve their problem, their shame, their downfall, their destruction in Babylon. What would God say? Would he say, take up arms and I will rescue? Or would he say, just wait for some supernatural act? And so they unseal the scroll of Jeremiah as somebody stands up and reads to these people in prison clothes as they hear from God. And here's what he says. Ooh, there, was, there it is. There's the message. Yeah. Jeremiah 29, 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. As an Israelite who believed in your heart that Jerusalem was the place where God lived, the, hearing these words was hard. 
Instead of saying running away from your problem or withdraw from your problem, which is Babylon, he's saying live into your problem faithfully. There will come a time when this changes, but for right now, you lack the control, and in fact, there is a time set for you, and you live in that faithfully. And that's takeaway one for us as we wrap up this year. Let's not hurry to run away from the problem and try to get over it real fast or hide away from the reality, but here's what God is trying to say in the in the Old Testament. Takeaway one, don't try to escape the hardships. Live faithfully within them. Live faithfully within them. I don't know what 2021 is going to bring. I hope it's better. But whatever happens, whatever the reality is, whatever we can control is our faithfulness to God, our devotion to God, our allegiance to God. That's what we can control. And maybe there's some other things we control, which is great, but don't hang your hat on that. The most important thing is to listen to God and say, God has something for me in this new reality. There is a garden for me to plant. There is a house for me to build. God wants me to be here. You see, in scripture, in the Hebrew culture, if you look at the Psalms, there are two genres, broadly speaking, two genres that take up the majority of the Psalms. There are the praise and worship songs, and then there are the lament songs. And what's happening here is God is preparing his people, and I believe he's preparing the American church for the reality of lament and praise. Praise is when everything's going good and you tell God, thank you. Lament is when things are going bad and you honestly tell God what frustrates you. But sometimes I feel like in, in our context, we skip over that part and we want to skip right to worship. And here's a definition of lament that I got from Soon Chan Ra. He is a pastor from uh, South Korea who immigrated to America. And he says this, quote, lament is the biblical response to the reality of suffering and engages God in the context of pain and trouble. The hope of lament is that God would respond to human suffering. Here's the thing. Lament, or this idea of saying, you know what, instead of skipping to how awesome God is, we're going to be honest about how difficult 2020 was or what we've lost in 2020. The beautiful thing about that process is it gives us the opportunity to be honest with God. And through this process, we actually gain clarity that the things that we're sad about that we lost the freedoms, the businesses, the opportunity for economic expansion, the shutdowns, the health issues, all of that stuff that we've lost in 2020, or maybe we didn't, but we know somebody that did. When we look at that and we grieve and we lament and we're honest with God that this hurts, God in there somewhere is saying, yeah, but am I enough for you? What makes you happy? Is it me or all this stuff? Because all this stuff is great, but it's seasonal. And if it goes away, will you be faithful? And so God allows the hardships in our lives to bring out the gold that is the salvation that he has for us. And think about this, even Jesus Christ himself, who knew that he had to go to the cross and die to save the world. He had this moment of lamentation, of crying and suffering, and most importantly, honesty with God. Remember in the garden, he prayed. Going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not I as I will, but as you will. Can we go into 2021 saying, Lord, not like we will, but like what you want for us? That's a dangerous prayer. Because if we pray that way, maybe God's going to say, you know what? There's more hardship in store, not because necessarily I even want it, but because the world is broken. But I think the problem in our context is I read this book and it talked about in just the American church, about 90% of the songs that we sing are praise and worship. God is good. He's going to move the mountains. I can get through this. Yes, yes, yes. My God is greater. My God is stronger, which he is. But because we sing mostly worship, we expect God to show up and fix our stuff tomorrow. And about 10% of our worship songs, based on this survey, are lament or sadness for bringing uh, pain and grief to God. So 90% victory, 10% lament. But if you look at the Psalms in the scripture, about 40% are lament genre, hardship. David going, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? I'm in the pit. Saul is after me. He's trying to destroy me. Get your head out of the pillow. Did you fall asleep? Like reality check. No glossing over the hard stuff. 
I'm going to tell you how I feel, God. And then about 50, 55% is worship. And then you got a 5% that are like royal psalms and things like that. But the reality of scripture is it prepares you for real life. It prepares you. I remember when I was growing up, you know, growing up in the 90s was so nice. Gas was 88 cents a gallon. We had Pop-Tarts and fruit roll-ups for breakfast. Power Rangers were on. It was a lovely time. The greatest economic expansion, right, during, well, in history, I think, during that time. And we immigrated, and we were in a Slavic church, and, you know, all the parents and grandparents had all these really what I call minor key songs, you know, Oya Grishnik Bedni. For those of you who speak Russian, you know what I'm talking about, or Oma Litva, Oma Litva, you know. When I, when I had hardship in the night, prayer would come to me. I'm trying to translate. I'm doing a poor job. I, I get it. And I always thought as a kid, like, what? Why are you seeing all this stuff? It's so sad and depressing. My life is great. What's going on with you guys? Well, they came from a culture of lament where they did not have the 90% praise and worship life that we had in the 90s. But here's the thing, church, that stuff got ingrained in my mind in this 2020 when I was going through health issues, when I got COVID, when I was going through stuff, my family was going through stuff. You know, I'd sit there sometimes and that Omalit Fasan gets stuck in my head. And their words would be on repeat because they prepared me for the reality of closeness and honesty with God. We need both praise and worship and we need honesty about the suffering and the crud that we walk through because all the holy saints walked through it, including Jesus. And we need to give our frustration language. We need to give our frustration a voice. Have you lost your job? Have you lost your health? Have you lost a family member because of COVID or cancer? Have you lost your pride because you can no longer provide for your family? Have you lost your job? Have you lost nothing but your family has? In the process of lament with God, we realize that the stuff that used to make us happy was all material. And then when it's all gone, all is left is God. And sometimes we're like, God, I'm not sure if this is enough. And in the storm and in the thick of it, when we've lost everything, when we're praying on our knees, we hear this voice from God. Yeah, you lost everything, but I am still here. Am I enough for you? Is my presence enough for you? And we're like, no, God, but you are, but I want my stuff back. And he's like, well, what if you don't get it back? Will I be enough? Will I be enough? Because where you're going, the new heaven and the earth, there is no sun because the presence of Jesus lights up the world. And what you have right now, you feel you've lost everything, but you have salvation. Your salvation is secure. What I did on the cross is victorious. And your momentary affliction is nothing compared to the word, the reward you're going to get. And even in this affliction, I am forming something beautiful out of you. Lamentation, suffering, giving voice to our problems takes a long time. If you read Lamentations, it's five chapters. It's a short book after Jerusalem was completely destroyed and laid to waste. The prophet is looking at this picture and he writes these words in chapter one. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. Like a widow she has become. She who was great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. And in the Hebrew, that first verse actually sounds like this. How can it be that blank? The princess became a slave. The city that was full became empty. The people who were princess and royal became servants. How can it be? Have you had a how can it be moment in 2020? I have. How can it be, God, that fill in the blank? The scriptures encourage us to have this kind of language with God. And and you want to know something really crazy? If you read chapters 1 and 2 in the Hebrew... It's a poem. It has lines in it, kind of rhymes in places. But every verse, one, two, three, four, starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet in alphabetical order, and it goes from A to Z. 
So the list of all the horrible conditions that the prophet really is frustrated with, all of the destruction is listed using this pattern. It's called the acrostic alphabetical pattern. So if we would apply that pattern from Lamentations to 2020, we would start with the letter A and we'd be like, 2020, A, atrocious. B, burdensome. As everything's been canceled, C, crushing, we've lost our income and everything has been canceled. D, diffusing, because we thought the shutdown would be for three weeks and it's been nine months. E, empty, right? and so on and so forth, until they get to Z. That's chapter one. And then they start chapter two and do that all over again. And if you were a Hebrew in Babylon listening to this, what you would be told is, don't hold back. Give your pain and suffering a full expression before God. From the A to the Z. And more importantly, the Lamentations calls the Israelites to remember, well, what did you do? Maybe part of this is something you have fallen away from God. Express not just your, your, your hurt, but confess your sin before God because he is faithful. And that's takeaway two. Lament gives us space to express our grief and sin fully. Here's a challenging question. Why? Why does God want us to identify and express our grief fully? Here's why I think he wants us to do it fully. Because in the process, we actually identify some idols in our life. For the Jewish people, here was their biggest idol. They thought, You know, God calls us to live a life that represents his kingdom. So we need to be generous with our time and with our money. And we need to take in the foreigner and the refugee. We need to treat other people in the name of God and the image of God. But you know what? We have this thing called the temple. And Solomon built it. Look at those holy bricks and rocks. God lives here. So we can kind of cheat on our obligation. We can treat people poorly. We can make a profit off the poor. We can do sexual immorality. We can do whatever. There is no way the city is going to get destroyed because the temple's right here. There's no way. That was their way of rationalizing their sin. And then Lamentations in chapter 1, verse 10, we read this. The enemy has stretched out his hand over all her precious things, for she has seen the nations enter the sanctuary, the temple, those who forbade to enter your congregation. Basically, what God is saying is, if you have a system for the Israelites, it was a religious system of temple version that replaces relationship with me, then you have become idolatrous and the system will be destroyed. I know for me, 2020 (laughs) has revealed that a lot of times I bank not on my relationship with Jesus, but on the religious system that I attended. I went to church on Sunday. I did these things. I showed up to prayer group. I did this Bible study. I had all the checks and balances. I did all the right stuff. And God sometimes goes and says, wait, but do you have a relationship with me, Boris? Or are you just doing the checklist going to the temple? Don't count on formalities. Count on relationship. Do I make an effort to start my day with prayer and scripture to entertain the poor and be hospitable? Or am I just chasing in the rat race the American dream, the American dream of just becoming more fortunate and having more status and living into that versus living into the gospel of Jesus? And in this process of lament, when bad things happen to us, there is this aha moment that we realize that all of the stuff that we have achieved can't do us a favorite when we lose control. And this is the good part about lament, guys. When we are honest and we are faithful and we open our hearts up to God and say, Lord, I have nothing left but you. God says, now I can work with you. Now I can work with my people. In Lamentations chapter three, as we wrap up today, the author comes to this realization after listing the A to Z's of all the hardships that he has come to, he finally realizes that he still has hope. He says this in chapter 3, verses 17. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So my hope, so has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gal. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But 
This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of God never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. When everything else was destroyed, all the gizmos and the gadgets and the wealth and the, all the stuff, and the prophet realized all he has left was God, he goes, aha, that's enough. That's enough because here's the truth. For all of the horrific nature of the destruction of Jerusalem, it was simply God being faithful to his word because he told Israel a long time ago, if you walk away from me, the destruction will happen. So the destruction was actually God being faithful. But also it says in Deuteronomy, if you come back to me and repent, then I will restore. So if God was faithful to destroying, more so will he be faithful to restoration. In fact, God's wrath is temporary. God's restoration is his fulfillment of his love. So there is hope because God has done for us on the cross what he would promise Israel to do in 70 years. So they had to sit around and they had to wait. They had to sit around and they had to wait because their salvation didn't come like in a day. It took them a few years, but God still promised to do it. I'd love to go through the rest of the prophets and the New Testament with you, but I know you have a, a New Year's thing to go to. So I'll just wrap up with this. At the end of the day, God fulfills his promise by sending Jesus Christ. And in Christ, he gives us salvation. And in Christ, he gives us purpose. And in Christ, he gives us a new hope. And so here's the thing. I hope and pray that as we wrap up 2020, that our happiness, our purpose, our fulfillment, our joy does not come from our exterior circumstances. How good the stock market is, how good my job market is, how good my health is. I hope our hope and joy and purpose comes from our identity in Christ. That's what Lamentations does for us. That's what 2020 can do for us. Don't let this hard year go to waste. God is reminding us that our satisfaction, our purpose and joy is in him. And guess what? There ain't no COVID that can take Christ away. There is no economic collapse that can take Christ away. There is no new world order that can take Christ away because he is the new world order. He is the one who created earth and all the planets and the galaxy and holds our breath in his hands. He is the one that allows evil to persist and be there. But he's showing evil and Satan and the devil that even the stuff that Satan wants to use to destroy us, he's going to use to form us. And in the end, Satan has already lost. My hope is 2021 is better than 2020, but it could be worse. And my job as a pastor is to prepare you. And I do know for certain that what you have is Christ and nothing can defeat you. And even if everything is stripped away, your hope isn't stripped away because nothing can take away salvation and freedom and purpose that we have in Christ. In the words of St. Paul in Romans 8, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. With this hope, I leave you and myself to finish up these last few hours of 2020. Here's takeaway three. Lament honestly expressing our grief helps us find full satisfaction in God alone. And that's a good thing. And that's something we can be thankful for. That's something we can hang our hat on. 